Welcome to the webinar today. We're going to be talking about how to get started with Roots Finder to help make your family history easy to research and easy to share. So here's our agenda today. We're going to talk about menus and navigation. So the top menu, the left hand menu, pedigree views and the person page. Then we'll talk about installing and using the web clipper. And then we'll talk about following hints. So first, let's talk about menus and navigation. Up here, we have the top menu. This over here on the left is what we call the hamburger menu. That's just what it's called in software development because those three lines reminded someone of a hamburger. So somebody called it that and now everybody calls it that. Whenever you see that on a website, it means there's a menu collapsed under there. And at Roots Finder, that's the left hand menu over here, which we'll talk more about in a minute. When I click that little hamburger menu icon, it will open or close the left hand menu so you get more space on your screen if you need it. Then we have the Roots Finder icon. Clicking it will take you back to whatever you've set as your home screen. In my case, I have it set to the pedigree view, but I could change that to the newsfeed if I wanted to. We'll talk more about how to change that preference in a minute. But right now, I just want to stay focused on pointing out the top navigation area up here. Here in the middle, you have a search bar. That's a quick person search. If you start typing a name, it's going to give you a list of all the people in your tree who match what you're typing so you can jump to them quickly. You can see I have a lot of Roberts. I just scroll down through them or keep trying to find the one I want. The next thing you come to up here at the top is this help icon. Clicking it, you'll see a menu of support options. The first one is the forum, which is where you can ask questions, make suggestions, or see what other people are asking or suggesting. The next one is our support center, where you can read articles, watch videos, or over here at the right, you'll see contact, which will let you send us a help ticket if you are not finding what you need. Then we have links to the blog and to our development roadmap. The next thing we have across the top menu here is the flag, which is where we'll put notifications for you. For example, if you had a JEDCOM that was importing or if a video was being made, you'll see a notification here when it's done. That way, if you don't happen to see the email, you'll still know when something is done processing. The last thing on the top menu here is your account settings. You'll see I've added a photo for my profile here so my family can see my face and recognize it's me. If I click it, I'll see some account options here, including my name, profile picture, and account preferences. And if you keep looking down here, you'll see our little chat icon in the bottom right hand area of the screen. We'll typically communicate with you by way of that little area because it's a lot faster and easier for you to have that out where you can see it. If you send us a message here, I typically respond pretty fast during the weekday, but sometimes I'm away from the computer. So if you just send us a message, I'll get back to you just as soon as I can. So then over here, we have the left hand menu. This top button shows the name of the tree you're currently working with. If you click it, you'll be able to switch between your various trees. So the trees you've created or the trees you've been invited to. This is also where you would create a new tree if you wanted to. You just click new tree down here at the bottom and then it will guide you through the tree setup process again. The next button in the left hand menu takes you to the pedigree view, which we'll discuss in greater detail in a few minutes. Next over here on the left, we have the news feed. So you click that and it will take you to your news feed. That's a summary for you and your family of what's been going on with your tree, including new media, hints, other stuff. Over here on the right, you also have some information about your tree and also your bookmarks. We'll talk more about how to bookmark someone in a few minutes. Then back over here on the left, you have your list of people. That's everyone in this tree. Again, you can just use the search area up here and start typing and it will filter your list to people who match what you're typing. One cool thing about this search box, as opposed to the one at the top, is that this search box will do a keyword search, so it's not just names. Let's say I'm looking for someone born in Indiana, but I can't remember their name. I just type Indiana, and you see that's people's names. They aren't Indiana, but they had an event in Indiana. Next, here on the left, we see the media wall. I click that and it shows me my media like Pinterest does. I just click an item and I can see details about it or I can share it with my family on Facebook. People can like it with this little heart icon right here 
or they can comment on it. If I wanted to edit it, I would just click this pencil here at the top. I could also download it or delete it. The next thing over here on the left is my list of leads. If I click that, it shows me all the leads I have in my whole tree. Again, this search box at the top of the list here is a keyword search box. So again, if I want something from Indiana, I type Indiana and yep, I do have something here for Indiana. Okay, so next over here on the left is users. Users are other people I invite to my tree. When you click this, you'll see the people you've invited and what permission you've given them. One thing that's really important to us at Roots Finder is that nobody can change your tree without your permission. Also, nobody can see information about living people without your permission, even if you've made your tree public. So that's where invitations come in. To invite someone, you click this plus sign over here, then you put in their email address, their name, and whether you want them to be able to view or to be able to edit. One really cool thing is that if you've given someone permission to edit, you can see what they've done by clicking their name. In this case, neither my mom nor my sister have added anything, but if I click my name, I can see what I've done and it's basically the same look and feel. After someone accepts your invitation, you can change their permissions back and forth, or you can delete them all together by clicking change right here and then editing or deleting their permissions. So then the next thing we have over here on the left is the content lists. These are just what they say it is, lists of different things in your tree. So you have evidences, notes, sources, and stories. So I'm gonna go through each of them for you. Evidence, if you recall, is defined as the tentative answer to a genealogical question. So in this list of evidences, you have here lists of theoretical answers, like when was my great-grandfather born? Well, according to this source, he was born 1 September 1903. Again, the search area at the top is a keyword search for this list. So if I type Indiana here, I get a list of all my evidence. So all of the genealogical questions that are theoretically answered in Indiana. I see the type of evidence, the date, place, the source it came from, and the person tagged. I can sort any column here by clicking the header. If you click an item, you'll open its card. Then click the pencil if you want to edit it, or click the trash can if you want to delete it. If you click a person's name, you'll go to their person page. This uh, section is a bit advanced and you might not ever use it, but it's there for you if you want it. So then the next list we have here is notes. This is a list of all your notes, including notes that were imported in your GEDCOM. One cool thing I do with Roots Finder is I put research calendars and reports in the notes section. So if I wanted to, I could find them again here. Again, this is a keyword search up here. So let's say I want to search my notes for a particular microfilm to see if I've ever used it before. So I just put in the film number. I'm going to do 481074 here. And I do see that I did reference this film previously. And again, I click an item to open its card and I click a name to go to the person. Next in the content list is sources. Sources are where you get evidence. So they're things you use to answer genealogical questions. If I want to know what sources I've used from Indiana, I just type Indiana or whatever up here in the list search box. And here I get my list of sources from Indiana. If I click it, it opens up its card. And finally, the last list type here is stories. Here I have a list of the stories I've added and who they're tagged to. I can click a title to open it and I can edit it right here if I want to, and I can even post it to Facebook right from here if I feel like it. So that's the content lists. Next over here on the left, we have apps. We only have one app right now, and that's the Web Clipper, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So then next over here on the left comes reports. Right now we have six key reports in Roots Finder. We have the fan chart, an on and toffle, a family group sheet, a pedigree, people without parents, and a place list. So the fan chart looks like this. You choose the center person and you get seven generations here as a PDF and a new tab. Then the on a Tuffle report is kind of a collapsed list pedigree view where everyone has a mathematically calculated number that's assigned to them. You select the root person and then again you get a PDF here in the new tab. With family group sheets you select the, fam the primary person and their spouse. 
For the pedigree, you select the root person and the number of generations to include. And then the people without parents report is a list of all your ends of lines. And the place list is a list of people who had events in the location you type in the box here. These all create a PDF report in a new tab, which you can print or save to your computer. And then the last thing we have over here in the left-hand menu is the settings. Clicking this will open the settings page for your tree. Remember we talked about your profile up here in the top right corner? That controls things about your profile, like your profile picture and your account preferences. This settings button here at the bottom of the left menu is for things about this particular tree whose name you see is shown at the top of the left-hand menu over here. When you click the settings, you'll see several different sections on the setting page. At the top here, you'll see um, your preference as to what you want when you open Roots Finder. Do you want to see the pedigree chart or did you want to see the news feed? Make your selection and click save if you want to change it. Next is the root person. You can change who's shown as the root person in the pedigree by typing their name in this box, selecting them, then clicking save. And the bottom here um, determines whether by default you see the expanded timeline on a person page, which includes secondary events they may have participated in, like the birth of a child, or if you want to simplify their timeline a little, you can just hide those extra events by default. You can always turn them on or off temporarily on the person page too. So we'll talk more about that later, but those are your tree preferences. And the next are tree settings. So here you have the tree name, whether it's public or private, who you want leads for, and where you want leads from. Then the next section is the GEDCOM export, but that's currently in testing. Um, and then finally you have the tree delete. If you decide you don't want a tree anymore and you want to just blow it away, click delete tree and it will be gone. But we can't recover it at all. Once you click that, it's gone for good. So be sure you want to do that. Okay, so that's the left-hand menu. So now let's talk about a few more um, navigation things. So let's look at the pedigree view here. This down arrow here lets me change pedigree views. We have the traditional four generation, which, which expands when I click that arrow over here at the far right. So then next in the views, we have a fan view. And when I hover over someone, it highlights their path in the chart and gives me more details about them and their path over at the right. The next view is the fractal view. It makes kind of a neat little heart-shaped view tree that's kind of fun. And then we have the ancestors and descendants. In this view, all the children are side by side, and that makes it really easy to see who you have profile pictures for, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then you can drag the tree around, you click this up arrow to show more generations back, and then you click this little ellipsis down here, these three dots, to show the descendants for a person. Then we have a descendants view, which traces the line down from a person or a couple. You click to open, and then you just keep you know, tracking generations down as far as you like to. And then lastly, you have the circle view, which works pretty much the same as the fan view. With all of these views, anytime you click a person, it will open their card, and then you can go to that person page. So those are the pedigree views. Okay, so now let's talk about the person page. The person page is a really important page. You'll do the majority of your Roots Finder work on this page, so I wanna make sure you know everything it can do. This area up here is called the header. Over here on the left of the header, I have the person's profile photo, and then this area to the right of the profile photo is the profile summary. It has their name, birth date, and place, the death date and place, and their parents. It also has gold stars showing how many sources they have and green circles for the number of leads they have. And then I can set the profile picture or change the background photo by clicking the areas there and just setting the photo from the ones that I have or by uploading something new. Then I can change what information I want to be shown here in this header by clicking any of the facts. I can click the name and here I have a list of the evidence. So if we remember evidence is the tentative answer to a genealogical question. So here I'm asking, what was my great grandfather's name? And I see evidence. Here I see evidence, a possible answer that it was Lieutenant T.C. Hill, 
That was according to the Journal of American Medical Association. But I don't really like that evidence. To me, it's an answer, yes, but it's not really a satisfactory answer. Rather, I like this evidence here, that it was Thomas Clark Hill. That evidence came from two sources, a database and also my grandmother's death certificate. I like that answer best, so I'm going to select it. I'm free to change my mind at any time. I can switch things back and forth. These answers will still be here as my research continues to unfold. And if I don't like any of them, despite what the sources say, I can just enter what I want down here and click save. This is my database. It just helps me see what the evidence says and helps me guide my decisions by the evidence. So then, likewise, I can do the same thing with his birth and death date and place. I click the fact. I look at the evidence in the sources, and then I select what I want to see in the header summary. So while I have this card open, I can also click through the different sections to see what they say and set my preferred summary information in the header. Okay, so that's the header. And then under the header, we have the toolbar. With this tree icon, I can open a pedigree view with this person at the root. Um, next, I can bookmark him. This will create a shortcut right to this page from the news, pa the news feed. This star is so you can mark someone as a person you're interested in getting leads for. If you marked everyone, don't worry about this star. Just click this if you want hints about this person, but not other people. Okay, this icon is the Family Search logo. You'll click it for all the Family Search integration tools, including downloading media and sources for this person from Family Search, which we will cover in another webinar. This is the evidence analysis report. It lines up sources and columns across the page and then lets you compare information that's found in each source side by side. It's really helpful for identifying and resolving conflicting evidence because you can see how the information changed over time or how the various sources agree or disagree and then you can analyze them and find out which is more likely to be correct. This icon here, this little film strip, makes, um, lets you make a video from the media that's associated with this person. Click it and you'll see the video options, including text, narration, and music. Now, back here, this icon is for sharing. When you click it, you'll be sharing this person page on Facebook, Twitter, or Pinterest. And this icon opens the header information we looked at earlier, and this trash will delete the person. You can't get them back. So once you delete someone, they're gone for good. So make sure you really want to do that. Okay, now here below the header, you have two columns. The first thing we have in the left column here is the timeline. Each of these events have sources. If you click the source title, the information will expand. You can expand them all by clicking this expand here above the timeline. Likewise, this collapse will contract everything. This show will let you decide whether you want to see relatives events in the timeline or not. This plus sign over here lets you add a new time event, timeline event, which is something we'll discuss in another webinar. So for now, let's look at the items in the timeline. When you expand an item, you'll see the source title followed by the primary event for that source. Then you'll see any images attached to it. Under that, you have the source citation, and then you have information about each of the people mentioned in this item and the evidence the source provides for them. This helps you evaluate the source and really analyze the evidence. When you keep scrolling down, you'll see all the events, sources, and facts this person has been tagged in. And then at the bottom, you'll see notes. That's the left column of the person page. And now in the right column of the person page, first you see the media that's attached to them. Over here at the right, you see a plus sign. Click it to add the media. Give the media a title, upload a file, give it a date and a place, then tag people. Finally, you can add notes about the media if you want to. All of these fields are totally optional. Underneath the media section, you have leads. Leads come from two sources right now. You have Roots Finder Partners and Roots Finder Users. Roots Finder User hints are created by clicking the plus sign over at the right and then giving the hint a title, tagging people, and adding information about the lead source, such as the URL and what to look for. This way, users can create to-do lists for themselves and guide other family members to participate in the family research. Roots Finder Partner Leads look the same as user-generated leads. 
We'll talk more about how to add information from these leads in a minute, but for now, let's keep scrolling down the right side of the page. After the leads section comes the family members section. First, you see parents and siblings. Clicking any of these names will take you to the person's page, so I typically like to right-click on them and open the link in the new tab so I can keep the first person's page open until I'm sure I'm done with it. If you click Edit here, you'll be able to edit the family structure. You can remove people from the family by unlinking them. Clicking the, sp the plus sign up here at the right will let you add a father, a mother, or a sibling. And similarly, the Spouses and Children section below here works the same way. If you click Edit, you can reposition children between the different spouses, or you can click this unlink and remove them from the family. If you click Plus, you can add a new spouse. So that's the person page. Okay, so there are two more important things I want to go over to make sure you get the most out of Roots Finder. Those are the Web Clipper and how to accept leads. The Roots Finder Web Clipper is a new, super fast way to do genealogy data entry. Right now, it only works with Chrome. So to add it, you go to the apps over here in the left menu and then click Roots Finder Web Clipper for Chrome. Go ahead and install it. And the Roots Finder icon will now be shown in the extensions area of Chrome. This makes it available to you when you're doing genealogy research, even if you don't have Roots Finder open. It's really cool. So to use it, you're gonna log in with your Roots Finder username and password. Then you're going to go about your research the same way you always would. Except now when you find something, instead of opening up desktop, um, desktop software, all you need to do is click the clipper and you'll be able to start doing your data entry. To make things even easier, if you're working from a major genealogy website, we've kind of trained the clipper to read. It will automatically process as much information for you as it can. So if you're on a page with a transcription, it will identify the primary event, the source citation, and all the secondary events that have been indexed. All you have to do is tag it to the people in your tree. We'll have another webinar soon to teach you more about how to use the Web Clipper, but in the meantime, you can also find more help in the Help Center. So just click the question mark at the top menu of Roots Finder and then click Support if you need help with it. One thing you will want to know about the Web Clipper, it's free floating, which has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is you can resize it and you can move it around the screen wherever you want on your monitor or even between um, two double monitors. You just drag it where you want it to be. That way it doesn't block any text and it just it makes things go a little bit easier for you. But the disadvantage is that if you switch to another tab, like if you're going to verify something, you might think you lost it. So in Windows, the easiest way to kind of to get it back for me is to use Alt-Tab to switch between my windows. So then alternatively, you could hover over the Chrome icon in your taskbar, see the thumbnail for it, and then click to switch back to it. And that way you haven't lost it, you just are switching between windows as needed. So then with the Web Clipper installed, now you're ready to follow leads. So to do this, you're going to click a lead on the person page. Take a look at the information and decide if you want it or not. If you want it, click the Clipper. It will load as much as it can for you. So feel free to add additional information if you want. Then tag people in your tree. To create a new person who isn't in your tree already, just type the name as you want it to appear in your database and click New. When you save, you'll be able to update the summary in the person page header with new information if you want to. Click save and you're done. The suggestion will be removed from the leads on the person page. So that's Roots Finder. I know this has been a lot to take in, but we designed it to be powerful and yet intuitive. So as you click through things, it should naturally come to you. And if not, just give me a shout and let us know where you're stuck. Thanks for watching and good luck.